And here we are. We now have reached the final session. In that session, we will explore here with the moderator, Professor Silberman and her panelists, the challenges, opportunities, and strategies the HCCH will meet and advance ahead. We will also go over our key conclusions from the breakout sessions. And then we will say farewell. The key conclusions from the breakout sessions will be presented by the chairs of those sessions. And in a moment, I will ask Hans van Loon, the former Secretary General of this organization, Professor Anselmo Reyes, uh, the former representative for the Asia and Pacific region of this organization, and Niklaus Meyer, the delegate for Switzerland, to come up in turn and present the findings of their respective breakout sessions. We'll then hand over to Professor Linda Silberman, uh, who will be the moderator, and um, she has been introduced several times by now, and I don't think I have to do it again, as well as the Secretary General of the organization, Dr. Christoph Bernasconi, and Sir William Blair, who also joined us before on a panel. But we have two new panel members. Professor Nadia Di Araujo practices law as a founding partner of the law firm Nadia Di Araujo Abogados. I excuse for my Spanish, it's not very good. Uh, she's based in Brazil, where her work consists primarily of cases dealing with conflict of laws, jurisdiction, international legal cooperation, and she teaches also and lectures on international law and has been a member of the law faculty at the and here's another one, Pontifical Catholique, or University of Rio de Janeiro, since eight, 1985. And we welcome De Deputy Director General Xiaomai Guo, who has been with the Department of Treaty and Law at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing since 2017. That department reports on legal issues concerning foreign affairs and international law developments. And it is her responsibility for concluding bilateral and multilateral treaties and conducting international judicial cooperation between China and other countries. And prior to that role, Ms. Guo was a counselor at the department of that, uh, of that department and a counselor at the permanent mission of China to the United Nations. Her profile is at page 21. If I now can call upon the three rapporteurs. Um, the order I leave up to you to report on the breakout sessions will, will form the basis for this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you for making uh, my job all the easier. Um, I'm going to ask the rapporteurs to limit their remarks to about 15 minutes at the maximum so that then we can hear from each of the panelists. And then um, if there's time, we'll uh, turn it over to you for last uh, last questions. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Linda. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Um, with my co-reporters, we, we agreed that there are perhaps three broad avenues for future work of the Hague Conference that have emerged from our very fruitful conference. And each of these three avenues require the attention of the Hague Conference. First of all, uh, what has been confirmed is that there is a need to raise awareness of the instruments drawn up by the Hague Conference, their usefulness and their availability. There's far too little knowledge yet about these very useful instruments, having in mind, as Jürgen Basedow stressed, that these conventions are not closed. They are open even to non-member states. Second point. There is a continuing need to ensure effective operation of many of these conventions. Some conventions take care more or less of themselves, but in particular, the cooperation conventions require continuing uh, attention and, and assistance with implementation and operation. Third point, there is a need to explore and, where possible, to address through new instruments, binding or not binding, topical cross-border issues that 
continue to arise in our globalizing world as a result of increasing mobility of people, but also of uh, technological uh, developments uh, like blockchains. And they are growing in volume, and they are growing in complexity. So that's a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. But all these three points are challenges and opportunities. Turning now to family law, again, three preliminary remarks perhaps to make. First, if you look at the volume of Hague Conventions in the Yellow Book or on the website, and you include the conventions on family um, relations and family property law and wills and successions, then you realize that half of the conventions of the Hague Conference deal with family law matters. That is an indication of the importance the organization has attributed since the Second World War to, to this area. Linked to that is that the Hague Conference is unique in the field of family law. In the commercial area, there's work done by our sister organizations, UNIDOA and UNCITRAL and others, and we need to cooperate and, and coordinate our work, but there's not much competition or uh, equal interest in other organizations. And um, UN organizations such as UNICEF and UNHCR and the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child look to the Hague Conference for guidance in the field of making more concrete what they have in, uh, in their uh, remit. And vice versa, yeah, of course. The Hague Conference is the global organization in cross-border family relations. Then, last point, um, all of the family law instruments, in varying degrees, admittedly, um, touch on, interact with global and regional human rights instruments. You could even argue in our globalizing world that there is an emerging human right that requires states to make an effort to construct the legal architecture for our global world that avoids limping relations, non-recognition of established relationships, and that protects vulnerable people, children or adults. In any event, in any event this human rights connotation of the family law area gives a clear strategic direction to the Hague Conference to continue its work. Now, we could not possibly deal with all the family conventions. We have not talked about the marriage convention, the divorce convention, marital property, successions, etc. Although some of these conventions, I believe, still have enormous potential in our world. We focused on the children's conventions, child abduction, adoption, 96 convention, child support convention. Um, but it was also pointed out that the adults convention will require more attention. In respect of all these conventions, a few points emerged also very clearly. There is a need for inclusiveness, a continuing need to take care, and that is not a, quite the same thing as universality. It means to take care of all the different legal traditions represented in the conference. We need to take the needs of the Latin American countries seriously. We need to take the interests of the African countries seriously and give more attention to them. That was heavily stressed. There are the Arab countries, there is the Islamic world. It's important to be as inclusive as we can be, and that also means that there needs to be a certain tolerance, that if there are needs of a certain group of legal traditions, then perhaps others that are less interested should make room and enable the conference to deal with such interests. And that deals, uh, that touches on the question of consensus that our Secretary General uh, addressed. Family law and commercial law may be distinct fields of law, and you have lawyers who are interested in one field and not in the other, etc. In real life, they are interrelated. Investment, mobility of people go hand in hand. So, uh, it, in, in, in real life, the two fields are, are very important, and we should not lose sight of it. And in fact, the family law conventions, especially those on cooperation, for instance, have been influenced heavily by the work we did in, in the field of uh, legal cooperation, civil procedure. Third point, um, we need to be in the family law area more aware 
of the evolving nature of the concept of family. It's changing all the time. And different countries, different regions may have different conceptions. What keeps the notion of family moving? What values are implied? That's a fundamental, basic, almost philosophical question, but with strong sociological and ultimately legal implications. Finally, we need to be aware of the issue of uh, access to justice all the time, which is particularly complicated in cross-border issues. Now back to the three avenues, awareness. Raising awareness is essential. Far too little knowledge is available on the usefulness of the Hague Conventions. How can we do that? There was strong support for continuing and even deepening the Malta process, the dialogue between countries on both sides of the Mediterranean, but expanded with other countries of different legal traditions. That has been appreciated and should continue. More efforts should be undertaken to sell, if I may say so, the Protection of Adults Convention. In our aging in our world where people get older and older, that convention is, is very important. Generally, um, it was suggested that we should be more inventive in finding ways of making our conventions visible. And that's, that's a difficult question. It was observed, for instance, that we have a wonderful website, but how to find your way in that? How can you require judges to, to, to find what they, uh, they... There's no ready answer to it, but it's a matter that we should attention, give attention to. So awareness, is, awareness raising is very important. Second point, mon monitoring and support. Here the Child Abduction Convention was put in the spotlight, and you know the, the crucial point with that convention is rapidity, is, is expeditious handling of cases by central authorities, by courts, etc. That remains a concern, and we should do what we can to, and there you have it, train judges, train central authorities, but who, who, who is supposed to do that? Can the Permanent Bureau do that alone? No, we can't. That brought us to the need to, of burden sharing between the Permanent Bureau and, and member states. And ideas were raised such as uh, better mutual information, um, for instance, by countries, member states, to the Permanent Bureau of what is already going on, better coordination in terms of uh, judicial training and so on. Um, there was a suggestion that more could be done in terms of making model laws for the implementation of, for instance, the Child Abduction Convention. It's already going on, but it's a point that was heavily stressed. Um, it was also recognized that the Hague Conference has done a terrific work in providing guides to the application of conventions in a changing world. The, uh, the five guides on good, to good practice on the abduction convention, which were drawn up under the auspices of our colleague uh, William Duncan, they are remarkable instruments. And I was recently asked to work on, on mediation in the context of child abduction in, uh, in America. I reread that document. It's fantastic. It, it is really useful work, and it shows how the convention need not be changed, and with that, the extra guides, you, you, you can still apply it in a changing um, world. Moot courts. Could we organize moot courts? Would be would be nice to, on PIL topics another idea that was launched. Not something for the Permanent Bureau to do, but perhaps for the member states to work on. Burden sharing is, is perhaps a, a key word that might be developed further because it's clear that the Permanent Bureau cannot do everything. There should be more of an equilibrium between the work of the Permanent Bureau and the member states. New topics, finally. Strong support and interest for the ongoing work on parentage questions about it, but uh, no question that it is a human rights imperative to continue work on that topic. Strong support, very strong support, I would even say, for the work on recognition and enforcement of agreements, 
party autonomy is on the rise, not only in the commercial field, but also in the family law area. It is important that if parents can, if, if couples, families can agree on how to deal with their situations, that is better, less costly, uh, more sustainable than when they have to go to court and so on. So for God's sake, let them do it themselves. But then it's a human rights imperative that what they agree will be recognized and enforced in other countries. So strong support for continuing work on agreements. Mediation, of course, enters into that, and that is also something that we should not lose sight of and continue. Um, one thing that I should not forget to mention is that it was mentioned as one way of reducing costs and remain equally effective is that more use might be made of uh, conference calls uh, instead of having experts groups of people coming to The Hague to do it via new channels and I'm sure that the Secretary General is giving attention to that already but that was mentioned as a way of avoiding too much burdens for everyone. Non-marital relationships. It was taken off of the agenda, but there was strong support and a strong feeling that that is an important topic and sooner or later should come back on the agenda. Again, it's a human rights imperative that if relations exist, are being honored in a certain jurisdiction. It is not... You cannot explain it to the people that when they move to another country that their relationship is no longer respected and, and valid. Um, aspects of migration was raised by Pastor Poker yesterday. There was no time to go into that in, in any depth. But it is, of course, true that the migration issues, although they are not, strictly speaking, private international law, they, they accompany us like a shadow. And we, we cannot just put that aside. We need to look at that in, in one way or in another. Finally, we had a short discussion on the kafala. You know the kafala is a functional equivalent to some extent of the adoption that we have in other countries. And some work might be uh, useful in that, that area. I think that is more or less a terrific, decent a summary. A terrific summary. I was there, okay. and that is a wonderful uh, summary and thank you very much because there was a lot said and you've managed to get it all in uh, in a limited amount of time. So um, now we'll move to uh, and someone are you going to do next? Yeah? Okay. Niklas? Uh, so we'll move to um, international and commercial no uh, international legal cooperation okay and civil procedure. Ladies and gentlemen, um, the um, session, the breakout session, was guided by four themes. First was what one might call the overriding objective, is what the Secretary General said uh, yesterday. The status quo is not an option. So one was not allowed to say that things should remain the same. The three underlying objectives were this. For legal cooperation and civil procedure, one should be guided by the principle of aiming towards ease of doing business promoting efficiency, cost-effectiveness, service to the citizens, to use Professor Arroyo's phrase of yesterday. Second, by greater transparency. Transparency in order to eliminate the corruption, in order to promote the rule of law, in order to engender confidence in the executive, the legislative, and especially the judiciary. And the third, underlying objective to further human rights, including improving access to justice and fulfilling what Professor Arroyo termed a duty of mutual cooperation. The um, breakout session um, approached this by going into three sections. The first section, general approach. The second section dealt with specific conventions. And the third section dealt with future topics or future projects. In terms of the first section, um, we discussed a variety of themes that underline, run through the conventions on legal cooperation and civil procedure. First, on legal cooperation itself, uh, some ideas were voiced. Uh, it was suggested that there should be more reference or more 
soft law instruments, guidelines, model laws, policy statements relating to minimum standards in more substantive areas of law touched upon by the conventions, including matters of evidence, matters of um, service, um, and in relation to what might, say, constitute a public document. Uh, these would be important, it was suggested, in order to instill or to promote best practice and guidelines for countries, especially for countries thinking of acceding to conventions and implementing those conventions. It was suggested that in particular areas of commercial law and the civil procedure relating to that commercial law, the law was sufficiently mature in order to have uh, guidelines of this sort, soft law instruments of this sort, and although it was contended by some that this might be forcing uh, countries to ascribe to particular substantive law principles, it was pointed out that soft law instruments, model laws, guidelines are um, matters of option. Countries can adopt all, nothing, or parts of the sort guidelines and soft law instruments. A further suggestion was greater use of things such as blockchain technology to eliminate a human interface in relation to the taking of evidence, uh, service in the use of apostille. So building on the EAPP. Um, we touched on the theme of regionalism and universalism or globalism. And the suggestion was that there should be perhaps a rethink of what exactly universalism means. Uh, it may be that you can have a universalism as an umbrella while still having regionalism, an Asia-Pacific perspective, or a convention relating to legal service and cooperation that is primarily uh, promoted or used in the Asia-Pacific or in, the Africa, in Africa or in Latin America. You don't all have to sing out of the same songbook. The Hague Conference's conventions can ascribe a universal standard, yes, but they can also serve as model laws, principles that can be adopted in whole or part by different regions, by different subregions, etc. So that one should be able to embrace this, one should rethink the concept of regionalism uh, uh, and universalism, and this may affect the role of regional offices and the presence of regional offices in particular regions. It is controversial, Christoph said as much yesterday, but it's something that has to be faced and there should really be a rethink about it. We talked about resources, scarce resources, financial resources, and we came up with that users should pay as much as possible the users should pay, subject to a few points that I'll come into in a moment. We also talked about technical assistance and the Hague's current approach to technical assistance. In terms of funding, more particularly, we discussed the UPO, the UPU, the Universal Postal Union System of Assessing Contributions. Maybe the basis can be changed, but most member states, perhaps possibly all member states, won't like to pay more. So maybe that's not so good. <laughs> a private sponsorship was uh, suggested. Um, the ha uh, why not have a foundation, Stiftung or Stifting, or um, uh, charitable organizations, uh, companies limited by guarantee with charitable status to which uh, businesses uh, other organizations can contribute in order to augment the uh, funds available to the Hague Conference. Well, there was some concern about that. Will that um, um, compromise the independence of the Hague um, uh, Conference? But it was suggested that, well, we have to live in a world, in a real commercial world. Some suggestions that were made to mitigate possibly uh, concerns about being tainted by uh, private enterprise were suggestions like, why don't we look into crowdfunding? Or why don't we look at the funding of specific projects by particular stakeholders? Say, if you have, for instance, a convention relating just by way of example to the insurance industry or the securities industry, why not have stakeholders within that industry fund that particular or uh, seek funding from particular stakeholders in that industry to um, come up with some instruments? soft law, hard law, whatever, in relation to that matter. The German example is rife with, uh, Germany is rife with such examples. Um, we talked about the possibility of, well, we then went into the second type, the second approach, going into some detail with a number of service conventions. The um, Apostille Convention, what can be done on a broad level in relation to the Apostille Convention. 
there was a suggestion that there should be stricter control on what constitutes a public document. And here, guidelines from the Hague Conference, soft law instrument, on what is actually a public document. Public document is left open to each state. Uh, what might be best practice in relation to public documents in light of particular problems, especially in the developing world, um, the, the, the problem always of fakes and, and uh, counterfeit documents, um, uh, some sort of guidelines on that might be a useful soft law instrument. We discussed Professor Basido's intervention uh, yesterday about the number of competent authorities within a reasonable distance from particular communities within a state or um, uh, the number of uh, the, uh, uh, competent authorities per head of population. But there seemed to be a feeling that uh, this was something for each contracting state to decide in light of its resources. And there was also a feeling that by going into more electronic means, using more um, uh, e-technology, one could obviate the need actually to travel to or to be there before the uh, um, competent authority, and one could do everything through the, uh, a lot through the uh, internet, especially through the use of encryption facilities uh, uh, available through blockchain technology, the universal ledger. Um, we talked about the access to a justice convention and the point that there was possibly an asymmetry, a north-south asymmetry. Because legal aid in developed countries was very generous, uh, legal aid in developing countries may be practically non-existent, um, the access to justice convention was probably more likely to be used by those from developing countries as opposed to those from developed countries. And there's this asymmetry of use. But it was pointed out against the touchstone of human rights, human rights asymmetry or symmetry has nothing to do, is irrelevant to human rights and therefore, this is just a fact of life of access to, the access to justice convention. And this is, if, if uh, for instance, Professor Arroyo is correct, that access to justice is a human right, um, then um, even without a convention, then such things uh, should nonetheless be available. We talked about the service abroad convention. Problems, it takes too much time. Translation can be... Um, can be um, really inconvenient, particularly if you have to translate to an obscure language for a particular contracting state. Judges um, might resist in using electronic documents because the suggestion was made there should be greater use of electronic protocols similar to, modeled on, analogous to the EAPP, the Electronic Apostille Program. Um, it was suggested that we should come up, or the Hague Conference should come up with e-electronic service protocols for the service uh, abroad of documents, perhaps a judicial guideline to the use of e-litigation to deal with those old, crusty judges who still will not embrace computer technology. Something analogous to the I support in relation to the 2007 um, um, Re Recovery of Maintenance Convention. We talked about the Evidence Abroad Convention, greater use of Vigilink, uh, perhaps greater use of e-technology in the uh, uh, compilation of evidence. And we talked about the problems in most civil law jurisdictions where if you're, uh, say, a lawyer and you simply fly out to get evidence from a willing uh, witness in some civil law jurisdiction, you're likely to um, be uh, cre committing a criminal offense because it's an affront to the national sovereignty of a particular civil law jurisdiction. And this is a problem in relation to these civil law jurisdictions acceding to evident, the Evidence Abroad Convention or embracing a wider use of uh, uh, video link uh, taking of evidence. So here, the Hague Conference would have to do more, I think, in order to produce some sort of protocol for uh, uh, civil law jurisdictions where this may be a problem. We talked about, um, again, um, funding, user pays. And as much as possible, the suggestion was that user pays except where human rights is an issue. In that case, uh, access to justice prevails or trumps um, a user pays um, mentality. Choice of court convention. Uh, it was suggested that there perhaps should be a soft law instrument on due process. That is what it means to have a reasonable op opportunity to be heard so that in terms of achieving a certain uniformity, not identity, across jurisdictions, uh, this soft law instrument might be useful. Uh, there were comments on the draft convention on recognition and enforcement of judgments. In particular, there was the suggestion or there was the uh, point that whatever convention you come up with, you need to deal with list pendants. Um, if we're dealing with later on a, um, some sort of instrument on jurisdiction, soft law instrument, guidelines, model law, whatever, you'd still have to deal with the problem of um, list pendants. Future directions, future projects. Well, the first one was... Um, 
there should be greater cooperation in international government organizations. It was pointed out that now regularly, twice a year, the Hague Conference uh, deals with other international governmental organizations. But I believe that the suggestion was much deeper than that. There should be a joint work program taking future projects and saying, you deal with this aspect of this project, I'll deal with this aspect of this project, and then let's meet together later on and put it all together so as to avoid overlapping and so as to make use of the expertise in various uh, international organizations. I've dealt with the illispendence matter. Um, there was a strong feeling, particularly amongst Asian jurisdictions, especially in China, uh, in connection with the Belt and Road, Vietnam, etc., that there should be a restart of the project on access to foreign law and proof to foreign law. Um, this was, uh, it was said that uh, there were not enough funds for this, and so that was dropped out of the work agenda. Uh, there was a strong feeling that that was, um, that was unfortunate. And, there were, and so the question was inevitably, where's the funding going to come from? But there's sufficient interest so that there may be, taking on the suggestion um, made earlier, multiple stakeholders, there may be multiple stakeholders prepared to help funding uh, this. For instance, those who run databases for uh, legal services, for instance, certain countries in connection with um, their needs, in the developing needs, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, and so on. Um, that it is suggested needs to be started. Develop judicial networks. Well, we already have the Hague Network of Judges. Outside of the Hague, there's the judicial, um, uh, the, the, the judicial uh, Judges Insolvency Network, JIN, in relation to cross-border insolvency. But there's probably greater need, it was suggested, for judicial networks in relation to other conventions on legal uh, cooperation and international civil procedure. There was talk about an international subpoena, a protocol for an international subpoena to support the evidence ordinance. However, the caveat was put, perhaps this should be um, uh, given a proper priority, and it should only be available after the exhaustion of other means available through either domestic procedures or through the evidence uh, abroad convention as it now exists. And finally, there was a suggestion that there be some instrument, possibly a convention, on civil aspects of corruption. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anselmo. And now we'll have uh, our last a uh, rapporteur uh, on uh, international uh, commercial and finance law. Michael, thank, you. thank you very much. So Professor Ray said that we don't all have to use the same songbook, but nevertheless, I will sing you a similar song. Um, we discussed more or less uh, similar topics. The first was um, the importance of awareness building. How can we achieve this? And we had interesting ideas such as uh, the importance of workshops for judges, um, support by regional offices, um, also support by regional academics. We could have a system of national contact points where law professors work for free, Mercedes uh, volunteer to work for free. Um, well, not really, but uh, uh, like to have a system of professors that uh, help the Hague Conference spread the message and have local workshops uh, also, at the student level, uh, we can have uh, moot courts, summer courses, or law professors could put, or the conference could put uh, videos on YouTube uh, with like the 2007 convention in three minutes, and this could raise awareness and help us all, uh, including also to raise um, awareness, but also unify the application of law um, with um, handbooks. Um, so. We were talking about the importance of non-normative work, and the message is, yes, it is important. Then we briefly just touched upon the question of what is private international law, and actually we managed to deal with this in like two minutes, so um, it's a broad thing. You have to think broadly, and you have to encompass a lot of uh, things, not only like the really tiny private aspect, but really think broadly because it covers in the international dimension also aspects that in national law would be more closely to public law, but on the international level, it's really broad. Then how can we uh, move faster to some results? Uh, where appropriate, we should use more non-binding instruments. And I insist on where appropriate, but also I insist on more soft law. So this would be a way forward for faster results. Uh, we touched upon the question of inclusiveness. There, um, the message was, well, if you want to have uh, an inclusive um, 
uh, organization, then go to the people you want to have included. So have our um, meetings also elsewhere than just in Europe. And also um, use modern technology. Um, we have internet, we have video, so let's use this. And let's also accept that some topics are more important for some regions and um, also then do this work. Finally, we had a list of 22 topics uh, that would um, be potential candidates for future work. I will not read them. We heard them over the last two days, but uh, just know that there are 22 topics that I will hand you over as bullet points. And uh, then the question is, how do we prioritize them? There could be a use of a system of ABC priorities. And uh, actually, the thing is, it will be for council to decide, but we all have to be aware that it's like a menu in a restaurant where we have to pick uh, a first course, a second course, and the dessert, and we cannot do all of them, so we have to prioritize. Uh, finally, we also had the question of the merger acquisition of other international organizations, such as uh, okay. Unidra uh, and Ancitral, but uh, for now, there, um, there still seems to be a raison d'etre of the Hay Conference, and I can say, Christoph, the show can and must go on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, and that gives us, this is really going to be Davos style because uh, we've had no rehearsal, no discussion, uh, and the panelists are going to give their uh, reactions uh, to the uh, summaries, uh, and I'm going to start uh, uh, with uh, Nadja first, if I might, and uh, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Linda, and thank you. It's a great honor to be part of this conference and to share with my colleagues, professors, state representatives, lawyers, and students alike such an intense and challenging flow of ideas for the future. For that, I thank very much the Hague Conference for inviting me and the Hong Kong authorities for their hospitality. We're gathered here to envision new possibilities for the Hague Conference. And to do so, we should take into account the lessons we've learned from the past. Certainly, Esser's quest for peace continues to inspire us all. It's believed that peace could be achieved through the creation of a harmonized set of rules plays an important role in our special and difficult discipline that many times private international law is known more just as a secret private code and must pass on now to a new color of contemporary challenge we now face. I would also like to pay tribute to Latin America, where private international rules have been on state minds and hearts since the Congress of Lima of 1878, and that were very much inspired by Mancini's ideas. Um, Mancini took great care in placing the individual first and show himself to be a huge adv advocate of party autonomy that we heard so much here in business and in family law. Among the many roles he undertook in his life, he never strayed far from practicing law. And perhaps his chart instinct and passionate speech so characteristic of a lawyer, ensure that his idea proliferated in Latin America as they strongly did. After our Lima Congress, uh, we had other initiatives like the Montevideo Treaties and the Bustamante Code, a complete set of rules that would never reach consensus in today's negotiation setting. In the 70s, Latin America had yet to take part in the Hague Conference. Uh, only four countries participate at the time. And the OAS, the Organization of American States, took the initiative of convening periodical conferences with the purpose of reaching new conventions for private international rules. These conventions, the Latin American conventions, which amount to 21, if I'm not mistaken, were heavily inspired by the old Hague Conventions. But after the start of the 21st century, until now, seven more Latin American states entered the Hague Conference, 
So today we stand strong and proud as a cohesive group with our fellow member states and take part in the global negotiations as never before in the Hague Conference. We even have a small group, the GRULAC. Mm -hmm. The main interest of Latin American countries in the Hague Conference lies, and has always been like that in a way, in the family conventions. We are all parties to the child abduction and to the adoption convention. As for international judicial cooperation, our regional conventions are in few you, full use, as well as some of the Hague Conventions. We participate in the service and the evidence convention and the essence of justice as well. Now, Apostille is also the most popular convention in Latin America and is in use throughout the continent. Now, I would like to say a few words for the future. In order to modernize private international rule is to make them accessible to the individual. So our challenge today is to devise means to do it properly, to ensure that Asser legacy will live for another 125 years, although we certainly would not be here for the celebration. The individual should be the Hague Conference ultimate client. We often lose sight of this. Hence, Van Loon mentioned awareness and visibility of the Hague Conventions. People need plain language and information in a more easy way to understand. I don't know if we should have a double site for the people. Like, I like the Hague Conference site for my research, but I wonder if the public uh, can deal with it easily. And I agree with Christina that there's a lot of information, and when you tell people what's there, they are usually surprised. Negotiations and meetings tend to revolve around member states' ideals, challenges, and goals. The people, our people, always seem to fall behind. That is, to ch that is what we need to change now, to put those who use and ultimately rely on our conventions in so many aspects of our lives in center stage to hear their voice. Easy to say, how do you do it? How do we change this perspective? I suggest a few avenues, as Hans has used the avenue word, for the future. We need to enhance, in my opinion, hate conference post-convention work, and that would include non-binding instrument related to the actual conventions. We should focus on creating better guidelines for central authorities so that they, in turn, are able to better assist petitioners. We should provide training for lawyers on the day-to-day -day operation of the Hague Conventions on Family Law. I, as an example, we can look at the 1980 Convention of Child Abduction. And that could be done under the leadership of the Permanent Bureau, but with close cooperation with several institutions, as mentioned here, university, professor association, judges meeting, Access to justice always means proper representation. We should aim at agreeing on more soft law instruments designed to address entire aspects of those transnational families for whom frontiers and borders mean little today. For example, the 980 Convention is a binary instrument, return or no return. Families have multidimensional needs they need to conditions for return. They need to deal with alimony, visitation agreements, recognition of their agreements in third party jurisdictions. We should raise awareness to the Hague instruments in plain language. We should also make better diplomatic initiatives for countries to accede to existing conventions on family law, as for example, the 96 and the 2007 conventions. At the end of the day, I believe the Hague Conference legislative and non-legislative work, through, though financed by the states, is here to serve the people and we must not lose our focus. 
our people, their family, and their business are counting on us. Thank you. Thank you, Nadja. Uh, you managed to highlight one of the themes here, which has been the regional uh, area and the importance of Latin America and a number of the other uh, issues that we have talked about. Um, and let me now turn to uh, Sir William for his uh, comments, please. It is now. Uh, I'm going to um, re uh, respond, uh, if I may, to the um, points that have just been made um, uh, very eloquently by the chairs. Uh, and if I may say so, also, um, uh, Professor de Arroyo, by yourself when, in family law. And I think, um, speaking as a commercial and, and financial lawyer, uh, to me, it's a great privilege to come and hear um, the kind of problems that you're trying to face in family law. They're, they're, very, they're very different from the um, problems that uh, we face in commerce and, and finance. But, but nevertheless, there's, there's that interchange between them. And as, as you rightly say, uh, we all uh, should be concerned to serve the people who um, use our services in, in commerce and finance or in, in, the, in the family field. The first point I want to make is, in a sense, the most obvious one, but I think it's also the um, one I, I really want to emphasize, um, both as a commercial lawyer and, and as a commercial judge. And that is the value of the work of the Hague Conference. Th this is something that really um, needs to be um, supported, and uh, and it has been supported uh, in any organisation that gets to be 125 years old uh, is doing a lot of things right. And if I may say so, to um, come here to Hong Kong um, to have this interchange um, to uh, uh, f focus on Asia is it's just one of the things you've been doing right. And so. Um, uh, Christoph, you, you and your, your staff de, um, deserve a huge uh, appreciation from all of us, and I, I know um, uh, that you have that. On the uh, um, commercial and financial side, very often in terms of private international law, the um, competition, if I can put it that way, to the work you do in the Hague Conference tends to come from the private sector. And for example, in various of the uh, speakers uh, yesterday um, at the uh, finance session talked about securities, and I think, uh, Professor Bavasta, you, you talked about um, that, uh, that as well. And um, uh, here, uh, there, are, there are organizations such as the International um, Swaps and Derivatives Organization based in, in uh, New York and, and in London. And they, they address a lot of these issues by reference to um, standard form agreements, uh, issues such as um, ju uh, jurisdiction, governing law, and enforcement, because in finance, very often enforcement comes through a netting process where financial institutions simply net off one uh, obligation against the other. But I know from my conversations with you, Christoph, that you have a, um, a close uh, relationship with ISDA. Uh, I know you're talking to them, and, and that gives me um, a a, a great deal of um, pleasure and comfort as well. Third, the importance of making the existing conventions um, have a greater uh, international impact. And uh, here, uh, the choice of um, court convention un undoubtedly, from our point of view, uh, um, is, is, is the most Im important, probably. Uh, and it's, it's, it's it's interesting to see that a convention that goes back 10 years really has come into its own recently. And um, I mean, Ch China signed it in, in September 2017, I believe. And uh, so you can, you can see um, how uh, you know, these are things with a long time frame. Then uh, n next on the judgments project, um, th this again is terrific work. And um, 
uh, the, 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 the work you're doing here is, is not just forming a, a kind of a basis for the mutual enforcement of judgments, but also it's important to bear in mind that the judgments project is enabling um, states and other actors to come together. They bring their expertise. They bring it over a period of time. And you're able to, um, uh, to, to use that expertise to put together the final convention. And by the way, I'm also very much in favor of the kind of um, soft law, uh, hard law analysis. I think there's a lot to be said for guidelines, um, possibly particularly in um, the uh, technology field where things are, need to settle down. We don't quite know where things are going. Um, but there's a need for both. Because what you, you get in, in a uh, major product, project like the judgment, judgment, Judgments Project is that kind of f focused contribution over time. And that's a very difficult thing to replicate. E everyone here has talked about technology and rightly talked about technology. And I think the only thing I would um, add to this is the obvious point that it's not the, uh, there's no question, no one here in this room would uh, question whether technology is central to where we're going. Of course, it's central to where we're going. It's going to um, uh, to um, uh, to to uh, uh, have a huge impact on um, the way we live our lives in the future, and we we don't know how that's going to um, work out. Of course, but from the perspective of the Hague Conference, I think really the two basic points are: firstly, timing and where, when you get involved. And secondly, the issue of specificity. And I think um, you know, a point that uh, came very, very clearly out of the breakout session too was just the, um, the, the, the need to avoid getting to a place where um, it, it's so general that it really ceases to be of any um, particular uh, um, benefit. And to pick up a point that Professor uh, Anselmo Ray, Ray's made, and it's a, an important point, uh, technology, of course, is going to impact not just substantive issues like um, securities, maybe, Professor, what we, what we mean by security, um, but also it's going to impact uh, dispute resolution too. And by the way, there's some very um, controversial and difficult questions that arise in, in, in this regard. And one of the things we must all, as a community, um, be prepared to do when it comes to um, technology is not to be afraid to challenge it and not to be afraid to raise the downside as well as the potential upside. So um, uh, uh, f f finally, um, again, there was a mention of um, developed net networks of judges. Uh, let, let me just um, repeat something I said yesterday. Uh, we, we, the English ju judiciary, um, have a, an initiative that we launched last year, a standing international forum of commercial courts. We've been um, in uh, contact with the Hague Conference on this. We regard the Hague Conference as being a, a very Im important on this. Uh, enforcement, of course, is one of the uh, huge issues for us. Uh, and um, this, this uh, initiative is supported by China. China has a, um, sent a powerful delegation to London last May and will to New York in this uh, in the next meeting in, in September. So I hope that um, brings together a few of the um, uh, issues from the perspective of finance and the judiciary. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me now uh, turn to uh, Deputy uh, Director Gao uh, for your comments. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator, um, Professor Linda, and uh, uh, it's my great honor. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, it's my great honor uh, to be here as a speaker of uh, this panel. First, I would like to uh, congratulate um, the Hague Conference uh, for holding this successful event. And I would also like to extend my appreciation to the um, three reporters uh, who has made a wonderful report for these uh, three breakout panels. 
Uh, during the last three days of discussion, uh, we have heard many ideas which are quite thoughtful, and many good suggestions have been put forward uh, on the ways forward uh, of the Hague Conference in the increasingly connected world. Uh, we all agree that in the past 125 years, the Hague Conference had continuously adapted to the needs of the times and played a very active role in promoting civil and commercial cooperation um, among various states and has grown into uh, the most influential intergovernmental organizations in the field of private international law. Well, at the same time, we also find out that uh, the private international law is changing, and the Hague Conference has faced uh, new challenges. In this context, I would like to uh, share with you my, some of my personal ideas. Um, I would like to tackle three uh, points, uh, and I think uh, some of them has um, already tackled by uh, some other speakers, but I would also like to share my personal views. First, about the universality. Uh, when I mention the universality, I'm not uh, used it in the field of universalism against regionalism. Uh, it includes uh, two aspects. Uh, one is the universality of the Hague Conference. Uh, in the past 125 years, the Hague Conference has expanded from an organization uh, centered on European countries uh, to an organization with 83 members spreading over five continents. This is a huge success, I think. And against more than 200 states in the world, that also means that a lot of work needs to be done to promote the universality of the Hague Conference in especially in the Asia and African region. Uh, we hope that it will not take another 125 years to have another new 83 members. Um, I think to raise the awareness of the Hague Conference and promote its universality, um, one of the idea uh, may be the, through the establishment of the regional offices. Um, I think that the regional offices, office of Asia and Pacific region is a very good example. Uh, since its establishment in uh, Hong Kong in 2012, uh, three countries in the region, uh, no, 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 not three, six, double six, countries in the region have joined uh, the Hague Conference and become its new members. I think the work ha already have done and the activities held by the regional office uh, has no doubt contributed to this outcome. Uh, the second aspect um, is the universality of the Hague Conventions. Um, among the about 40 Hague Conventions, some are very successful. Um, yes, some uh, uh, speakers are, have already mentioned the child abduction uh, service um, evidence uh, and upstyle. They are all very successful conventions. At the same time, uh, however, there are still some of the Hague conventions which have not yet entered into force or even and after entered into force with uh, very few, uh, not so much contracting parties. I think this is a question that the Hague Conference needs to think about and identify the uh, reasons. Uh, to serve this purpose, for example, I think uh, the Hague Conference may consider to develop a questionnaire and uh, conduct a survey on how countries have not been able to join specific convention. 
uh, for lack of, uh, of awareness only, or for insufficient research capacity, or for other, there were other uh, priority work of the countries, or for indeed there was um, legal obstacles, internal obstacles. So I think uh, based on its outcome of this survey, I think uh, the Hague Conference through the Permanent Bureau could carry out many targeted work. Uh, the second point I want to mention is about the methodology and approach we, we, we take. Uh, some of our experts have already uh, rightly mentioned out that the traditional content of the private international law is the issue of choice of law. Um, and the objective of the purpose uh, and the ob objective and the purpose of the Hague Conference is to promote the unification of the private international law. And I think that the unification of the rules of the choice of law is a very important uh, work. Um, however, just as uh, some experts have already mentioned, that the most successful convention was not the convention on choice of law, but but on the uh, legal cooperation. Um, why? Why is that we have this, this situation? So from my point of view, one of the reasons may be that compare, compared to the choice of law issues, legal cooperation have more priority for states uh, in their working list of international cooperation. Uh, for the sake of smooth conduct of the judicial proceedings with foreign elements, states do need to obtain assistance from each other uh, on various aspects, such as surveys or documents that taking of evidence. Therefore, states have more strong willingness and more urgent needs in uh, strengthening cooperation to solve these problems. Um, I think this is also the situation uh, in the early age of, uh, in the early stage of the newly opened up China in 1990s. I still remember that when I entered into the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in uh, 1995, that is 23 years ago, uh, my first task, I got my first task from my boss is to make a study on the feasibility of China to enter into the Evidence Convention. And I uh, go through a very um, sincere study and uh, get uh, my report to, the, to my boss. And the answer is yes. So uh, two years later, 1997, uh, China uh, deposited their instrument of ratification of this convention. So this is also a very important convention that China has participated. Um, uh, but comparing to the uh, law, choice of law issues, uh, things I think uh, a little bit uh, different because without an international convention, judges could also do the work on choice of law issues and try to find out the applicable law on the specific civil relations uh, according to his domestic legislation. So this is uh, may shed some light on us. So negotiating conventions is perhaps not uh, the only way for the Hague Conference to, to fulfill its objects and purposes. Um, on choice of law issue and also perhaps on many other issues that a uh, lot of speakers have mentioned, we may also achieve the goal of unification by making model law, uh, guiding principles, uh, best, best practices uh, with the aim to take an influence on the domestic legislation of different countries. Uh, uh, on the working method, uh, another comment uh, I want to share is that with the increase of his membership and the legal uh, traditions and concerns of different members of the Hague Conference, 
are also becoming more diversified. In such a situation, I think that uh, full discussion and trying every effort to reach consensus are especially important for decision making, uh, particularly in formal formulating conventions. If we are pursuing a successful convention, we have to take full account of the legitimate concerns of states and try our best to find compromise solutions. So voting, although very easy, very efficient, and also in conformity with the rules of procedure of the Hague Conference, I think could only serve as a last resort. resort. Otherwise, those members whose concerns are not or not fully considered will most likely choose to stay away from the uh, convention after its adoption. Uh, the third point I want to share is about the uh, participation of non-state actors. This is also one aspect of the inclusiveness of the Hague Conference. Uh, during the, uh, the last uh, days of the discussion, um, some experts pointed out the Hague Conference is a state-centered uh, international organization because the state is the legislator, judiciary, as well as very important stakeholder. Uh, meanwhile, experts also pointed, pointed out that it is necessary to expand the participation of non-state actors in the Hague Conference. Um, I think member states could always uh, welcome uh, different uh, contributions from different uh, stakeholders on the work of the Hague Conference. But at the same time, I would like to stress that it is very crucial for the future success of the Hague Conference to maintain its nature of an intergovernmental organization. And, uh, uh, and uh, the, um, it is very important that the concerns of the member states are um, uh, tackled. Uh, the participation, participation of academics, or legal practitioners, and also judges to the work of the uh, Hague Conference, I think, has no problem in the uh, current system of a state-centralized uh, um, um, mechanism. Uh, because you may see that uh, there are uh, the composition of the uh, state uh, delegation to the negotiations of the conference uh, composed of a very diversified they are composed of not only the uh, government official, but also from uh, academics, from um, judiciary, and from legal practitioners. And I think that they had also played a very, very crucial contribution to the uh, work of the Hague Conference. Um, and I am confident they uh, continue to do so. Um, for the international uh, government organization, uh, yes, we support the idea that we need to enhance the cooperation uh, of the, uh, with other international uh, governmental organization. Um, and uh, there are also some very good ideas uh, uh, come raised uh, during this, uh, uh, this three days discussion um, that we can extend, uh, lend my support to. Uh, as for the non-governmental organizations, I think in view of the large number, uh, uh, a huge diversity of the uh, non-governmental organizations, I think it is very important for the Hague Conference to uh, formulate uh, relevant uh, uh, rules or standards to, to decide what kind of in, uh, non-governmental organizations are eligible to participate in the work of the HIC conference, uh, how they can participate, and what they can do and what they cannot do. So that I think that uh, um, to make sure that their participation indeed uh, will contribute to meet the needs of the conference and contribute to the work of the conference. 
So these um, three points I want to share. And uh, in conclusion, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, congratulate again the uh, Hague Conference for the anniversary of 125, and also uh, to thank the Hague Conference for deciding to hold this meeting in Hong Kong. Uh, and I was also uh, to extend my appreciation to the uh, work of the regional office of the Asia Pacific, the uh, work have done for the uh, Department of uh, uh, Justice of the H Hong Kong SCR. And also I uh, could not forget to thank the um, our supporters from the uh, Hong Kong University. Uh, they have done very good. Uh, excellent job. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for this perspective uh, from Asia, from China, and the sort of emphasis on uh, other uh, methods for the Hague Conference, meaning soft law uh, and other methods of cooperation. I think it only appropriate to have as our last speaker uh, uh, Dr. Christoph Bersconi, who has put together this wonderful conference and is the person to whom all of these comments are now directed. It's now in your lap uh, for, uh, if not the next 125 years, uh, certainly uh, in the very near future. So I think we all uh, await uh, your final comments. Um, and uh, let me just add my thanks uh, for a sort of wonderful and exhilarating uh, conference and for all the contributions uh, from the rapporteurs and from um, the panelists. So I turn it over uh, to you for the last remarks. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'm going to make my comments from here. And I would, first of all, like to thank our three rapporteurs and indeed all participants in these breakout sessions but in particular to the three rapporteurs for feeding back the information so effectively. And I'm sure Niklaus and Anselmo will forgive me if I express a particular thank to my predecessor, to Hans. Hans, thank you very much indeed for having come all the way, first of all, in circumstances uh, that were heavy on you, uh, a lot of travel uh, involved. But um, if we celebrate today the 125th uh, anniversary of this is the kickoff event, it's also to celebrate all those that have largely contributed uh, to the history and the effectiveness and the growth of the organization. And I think we all owe Hans a big thank you for that as well. You will have understood that the purpose of this whole exercise at the end of the day is to feed the discussion that we are going to have with our members first in September, but then in particular also at the Council in 2019, when we hopefully will be adopting a new strategic plan for the organization. The discussion we had over the last three days is the start of a discussion that will uh, feed, I very much hope, the strategic plan 2019. So where to start when we want to rock the boat? And let me start by quoting Professor Basido, who I was very happy to hear, and no one picked up on that, but I was happy to hear him say, the HCCH must continue to exist. There is no doubt about that. And I could also quote Niklaus, of course, who very helpfully uh, said at the end of his intervention, the show must go on. Okay, well, that's a good start. Uh, line one in the strategic report 2019. But I have to admit that when, you know, thinking about the future and the strategy, all sorts of different scenarios uh, cross uh, my mind and continue to cross my mind. I tell you that status quo is not an option, and I actually mean it, but it also prompted me to you know, reflect on other scenarios. I recently shocked my staff, and I'm sure I'm going to shock you as well, by uh, telling uh, that one of the scenarios that crossed my mind was close the shop. I let these, word, these words uh, sink in. Close the shop 
is, in theory, uh, an option to consider. You could consider the Hague Conference closing the shop, Unidroit closing the shop, Ancetral closing the shop. You regroup all these organizations within an ICUN agency, a lawmaking body. You have regional access. You have all the languages. You have the political input. You have lots of uh, advantage. Of course, nothing would be the same. You would lose an identity, you would lose a lot in terms of uh, work being being conducted. And I certainly don't want to be quoted at the end of this uh, event as the SG suggests closing the shop. Um, I personally do very much firmly believe that uh, the world needs uh, the Hague Conference more than ever. Um, along the same lines of maybe slightly more gently rocking the boat, um, I still believe we have a problem with the name. I was uh, sharing in the uh, breakout session uh, the fact that we started very um, tentatively a discussion amongst the working group to suggest changing the name. I have a problem not with the private international law part, I have a problem with the Hague Conference part. Conference, because nobody understands what it means, and it's very much a problem in promoting the work of the, uh, of the conference, because the first reaction is, okay, when is the next conference? Is it open? Can I sign up? Or do you have a program? And the reference to The Hague, as much as we appreciate the strong support we are getting from our host state, and we are extremely grateful for that, the reference to The Hague is, um, you know, um, does trigger reactions uh, in, in, in terms of the Eurocentricity of the organization. It is a, 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 a reminiscent of the, of, the, of the past of the, of the organization and the uh, Eurocentric uh, history of the organization. Why not go for the world organization on private international law? Um, but as I said, this discussion was very, very difficult, and uh, we'll see if uh, in the course of our discussions on the uh, strategic report we can bring this uh, up uh, again. But let's assume for the purpose of the following uh, brief comments that the HCCH will continue for at least another 6,501 weeks. The first topic I had identified uh, also for, for us, of course, is universality and uh, inclusiveness. Um, but I have to tell you that whenever I have ambassadors coming to the office and we show them uh, the maps, the famous maps of the Hague Conference, I cannot show this map of the membership and say in a straight face that we are a global organization, a universal organization. We are not. Clearly, we are not. Look at Africa, look at uh, Southeast uh, Asia, look at the Gulf region, the Middle East. So much more work needs to be done in terms of uh, going uh, universal with the uh, organization. Of course, the story is a bit uh, different and a bit more positive if you turn it and you see the maps of all what we call the connected states, including the 68 non-member connected states. Uh, I think on that basis we can say that we are uh, making uh, very valuable efforts towards universality, but I think at the end of the day we should really become a truly universal organization also in terms of uh, membership. Um, reach out to African states, we talked about that, to Arab states, to uh, states with uh, Islamic law uh, tradition, increase the dialogue, reaching out, Malta, hopefully other processes. I'm sure, Madam Deputy Director, that the um, uh, Belt and Road Initiative will help us tremendously. I see lots of opportunities in the Belt and Road Initiative uh, to uh, spread uh, the work of the uh, Hague Conference throughout the trade corridors that the Belt and Road Initiative is, uh, is going to, to establish. And we are most grateful that the Hague Conference is actually quite closely uh, involved in, in um, uh, events that you organize uh, around the Belden Road uh, Initiative, and we are very grateful for that. But I think it is important to bring all these states, uh, additional new states, uh, to the table also when it comes to negotiating these new instruments. Uh, universality is also reflected uh, in the output of the organization in terms of the conventions. Uh, to have really meaningful global, truly uh, global conventions, all legal traditions, all parts of the world need to be um, adequately uh, represented and have the opportunity to give their input and have 
ownership over the process uh, as well. Regional presence, you know, my uh, position on that, I strongly believe in regional presence and uh, I think both uh, regional officers in Buenos Aires and here in Hong Kong uh, have led to tremendous uh, output and, and, and successes helping us in, in terms of increasing the visibility and acceptability of the work uh, in, uh, in the region. Uh, but I also think that universality comes with uh, going outside The Hague. Um, you may know that we attempted to organize the first special commission meeting outside The Hague. That was not yet accepted by, uh, by the members, but I think we have at least advanced the discussion on reaching out, going to other parts of the world, increase the visibility uh, of the work in other parts of the world, and indeed getting closer to the people uh, whom we actually want to, uh, want to reach. Technology is going to be another uh, aspect to rely on in terms of uh, increasing this universality and inclusiveness, um, and we are certainly uh, thinking about uh, that as well. Of course, I am mindful of the fact that universality and increased universality also has an impact on the actual operation uh, of the convention, and I will get back to this in a, in a, in a short while. In terms of legislative work, which of course remains the core mandate of the, uh, of the organization, I think we'll be looking uh, to continue to develop practical, workable instruments that respond to a real need that has been established by practitioners, by people who are exposed to these uh, issues and that bring these issues uh, to uh, the Hague Conference. I am quite convinced that we will continue to develop um, instruments, conventions uh, that facilitate cooperation. If you just look at the top five of our most successful conventions, some would actually argue that they have nothing to do with private national law, but establish and facilitate cooperation and processes. I think there is certainly a, a lesson to, uh, to learn uh, from that, so we should continue uh, to think along, uh, along those lines. I do realize that, yes, cooperation may not be uh, part of the unification uh, mandate stricto sensu, but it is what I uh, like to refer to as the fourth dimension of private international law, uh, jurisdiction, applicable recognition, enforcement, and cooperation, and certainly the Hague Conference has done its uh, uh, fair bit to contribute to this fourth dimension of uh, private uh, international law. But I'm equally sure that um, we will um, also continue to think about and work about and develop uh, instruments on the more classic uh, private national law questions. And of course, the Judgments Project is uh, the best uh, current uh, example for that. But I think we should make sure that we can position the Hague Conference in such a way um, that it is uh, able to react quite swiftly and effectively to new societal or business uh, developments. And the discussions we are having on surrogacy, for example, which uh, I understand triggered a lot of interest in your uh, groups as well, is a, is a good example. But we should also be able to react to uh, global uh, challenges. Um, Hans mentioned uh, repeatedly, and in my view rightly so, uh, environmental uh, issues. That was actually the first uh, study that I conducted at the Permanent Bureau, only to realize that the members uh, did not want to uh, work on it for for whatever reason, but because uh, maybe work on um, you know damage caused to the environment or migration issues that uh, Fausto uh, brought back or access to foreign law might be worth revisiting at some stage. Um, again, that is for our members uh, to uh, to decide. But the example of the blockchain discussion made me realize that maybe there is a slight shift that we have to operate in our uh, way we look at a life cycle of a, of a convention. Some of our conventions uh, have been there for quite some time and continue to be very successful. But if we were, for example, to embark now on uh, work on blockchain uh, in response to a need, let's assume, that has been uh, established, although I remain doubtful as to the actual practical operation of blockchain, blockchain technology outside of digital um, uh, currencies, but it's coming, the question is uh, when, uh, and I know that in the securities field uh, a lot of uh, testing is being is being done. Um, but if we were to develop, uh, say, uh, a hard law instrument on, on, on blockchain, and we do respond to a current need that exists, but in 10 years from now, blockchain will be, uh, you know, a thing uh, from the past, and something new will come uh, around the corner. Well, so what? 
then we have responded to a real practical need for 10 years effectively. We helped industry to operate, and then we move on and do something else. There is nothing wrong with that, I would, I would suggest. Uh, to the contrary, we would uh, prove that the organization is, is flexible and, again, can uh, address real uh, practical uh, needs. I'm also of those who are convinced that we will do more uh, soft law uh, instruments in, uh, in the future, uh, again, to also react uh, uh, more swiftly uh, to uh, developments. I, this is now me personally uh, talking. I take off my, uh, my SG hat, but uh, I think one of the next topics for a soft law instrument could indeed be the work that we do on jurisdiction. Uh, I do not believe that time is right for a hard law uh, instrument on, on jurisdiction, but I think we could do very helpful work uh, in terms of um, uh, jurisdiction in form of a, of a soft law uh, instrument. Post-convention services uh, will remain uh, very important, uh, certainly. Um, as uh, several speakers said, what's the point of developing all these nice instruments if they um, don't work in practice or if they are not uh, signed up to. So promotion, capacity building for state actors, professionals, uh, judges, notaries, uh, attorneys, uh, social workers, what have you, but then also in terms of implementation and, uh, and operation. Uh, we do that already uh, to quite some extent in cooperation with other organizations, um, intergovernmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, and universities, but I, I take the invitation to try and develop these, uh, these cooperation um, mechanisms. Um, videos were mentioned. Uh, we actually have a few videos uh, already if uh, you want to learn uh, something about the Securities Convention. There is... Um, this video that is a bit longer than three minutes uh, may put you to sleep, but it's there. There are now new videos that we recently did uh, in cooperation with uh, UNICEF uh, for an event that dealt with various um, uh, children's uh, conventions. That's certainly uh, a way to go. Guides and publications, uh, you know, guides to good practice, practical handbooks, and this and that. Um, will definitely be, remain uh, a core part of the work of the, uh, of the permanent uh, bureau. Cooperation with other organizations, these synergies, they, they, they do exist already, but again, I take the point that they uh, might be uh, developed. Uh, examples from the past are the, the, the excellent cooperation you had with uh, Ancitral uh, for their work on the Receivables Convention, where the Conflict of Laws chapter was actually developed as part of a joint uh, working group between Ancitral and the, and the Hague Conference. Uh, same was done for secure transactions work at Ancitral, uh, to some extent also for their work on insolvency. Uh, we did the same for uh, UNIDWA's work on, on securities, and there are other uh, examples uh, as well. But I think um, we should maybe also try to expand our cooperation with other regional organizations, uh, ASEAN, OHADA, the OAS, and, and, and other important uh, actors and similar other organizations in, in, in Africa uh, should very much be on our radar uh, as well. Now, well, I, I do keep quite close track on what's actually happening to uh, to our uh, conventions in, in 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 real life and and um, you know how long it takes for them to uh, to pick up and and some of the, the 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 figures and some of the data is actually interesting to put it uh, in, in neutral uh, terms. Do you know, do you know how long it takes on average for a convention a hate convention to enter into force? On average, it takes more than eight years for a Hague Convention just to enter into force. 8.14 years. Um, if you just look at the core conventions, which are basically the conventions to which you have a direct access on our website, uh, we bring it down to 6.0 years. But still, that is a long time. We put a lot of efforts, including the states, of course, put a lot of efforts in developing these instruments, and then it takes six or eight years for a convention just to enter into force. So in the old days, these were three states. In the new days, this is even you know, two ratifications are enough for a convention to enter into force, and yet it takes uh, far too long. And then if you look at other um, uh, thresholds, for example, uh, for a convention to reach a status of 20 contracting states, on average, more than 18 years. Ah, that's too long. That's far too long. Um, never mind the 50 parties we have 
five conventions that have 50 and more contracting parties. On average, it took 28 years to reach that, uh, that level. Um, so clearly, this is also an invitation to uh, our uh, members and other states uh, to reflect on their internal processes to speed things up and, and really uh, not just tell the, the conference as such that we need to do legislative work, but then also to pick it up and implement it and make it a reality so that the people who are supposed to benefit from it can actually uh, benefit uh, from it. Um, the impact of uh, universality on the decision-making uh, process, uh, I think there are two sides to that. Uh, at the council uh, meeting on general affairs and policy, when the moment comes to decide on, on new projects, I have referred to it as uh, asymmetric consensus uh, to bring in some flexibility, essentially, uh, to allow, let's say, an important group of uh, states, or a significant group of states, to embark on work that maybe a smaller uh, group of states would not like to embark on. I, I think we need some flexibility there to uh, continue to do uh, legislative uh, work, and who knows, at the end of the day, maybe the other states uh, would actually also embark and, and, and eventually uh, sign up to these conventions uh, as well. But the universality, of course, also reflects itself when we negotiate a new instruments, and it's difficult to reach uh, consensus on, on, on different uh, specific uh, topics, which is why I do believe that uh, in future we will do more of sort of a bottom-up approach, take things uh, you know, to where we can take them uh, at the reasonable level, as it were, uh, and not uh, try to go for the perfection and all uh, including comprehensive instrument, but really really do something that's uh, meaningful and can be um, applied in, in a relatively uh, short period of, of time. Uh, building blocks um, and, and you know, similar ideas, uh, easy wins have, uh, have all been mentioned and I think uh, we should certainly continue to uh, think about that uh, as well. I think that some of our conventions um, have really reached the the limit of flex of um, uh, complexity that we can uh, that we can uh, have uh, you know when you have conventions with uh, 60 plus or so articles that that is a lot of work and also for and a great challenge for states to to implement such comprehensive uh, instruments maybe a lesson there to be learned as well um, finally, I definitely would uh, like to explore further uh, how exactly the work of the Hague Conference relates to the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and in particular number, number 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions. Um, we have ideas there that we would like to explore also in relation to the 125th uh, anniversary, um, but uh, I, I have the feeling that there is, that there is quite a bit of relevance of the work of the Hague Conference in this regard uh, as well, and, and we should advertise this relevance and, and make it happen. Good governance of the organization itself is an important part, has certainly been a very important part of my, uh, my first term as, uh, as Secretary General. I think we need to strengthen the, the foundation of the House before we can uh, expand the House and, and, and do further work, but we have done um, uh, great progress there already, and technology will continue uh, to play uh, an important uh, part in that as well. And you will have, uh, or it, it will not surprise you that my last point is a reference, of course, to resources, because if all of the above is to happen, uh, then uh, we will have to have a serious discussion about uh, resources. Um, and I heard several times uh, in the past three days that, for example, the Adults Convention has suffered from uh, a lack of uh, support, monitoring, and promotion. That's certainly true, but it's just a reflection of the reality because we, we, we just can't do uh, everything. Um, I, I also think that it's the same for the Trust Convention, for example. We know very, very little about the practical operation of the Trust Convention, which I think is a, is a pity. Form of wills. We have no idea, basically, uh, how it works or if it works in practice. And so there is uh, really um, more work to be done in that uh, respect uh, as well. Now, I started my opening remarks by offering you a figure, which has been challenged, but I stick to it, 6,501. That was actually the exact period of time from the 12th of September 1893 to the day I made my opening speech. And I stick to the 6501. 
Now I offer you 27,147. 27,147. And you may wonder what does that mean? If you take all the Hague Conventions and you sum up all ratifications, accessions, and approvals of all of our conventions, the total number is 828. 828 ratifications, accessions, and approvals of all Hague Conventions around the world. Do you know how many bilateral conventions or treaties it would take to establish the same type of network between all these states, 27,147. So multilateral Hague Conventions replace, for lack of a better word, 27,147 bilateral treaties that would otherwise be necessary to achieve the same type of uh, relationship and network. I would respectfully suggest that states save a lot of resources by going the multilateral way instead of the bilateral way, and that maybe some of these resources could be fueled back into the organization uh, to help it grow from strength to strength in the next 125 uh, years. And on that note, I end my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph, for those uh, really sort of inspiring, uplifting, and summary comments of things that have gone before and things to come uh, in the future. Um, I first would like to uh, thank our rapporteurs, uh, who did a wonderful job of trying to bring these things together, and our panelists uh, for their uh, insights on uh, all of those uh, summaries and comments. Um, on behalf of all of you, um, I would like to thank um, the Hague Conference for this uh, terrific uh, event. Um, to you, Christoph, for the organization um, and thought that has gone behind it. Uh, to Thomas John, who we've all heard from, all of those emails and all of those preparations. Um, to Hong Kong for uh, the wonderful hospitality uh, of the entire day and the last night, uh, last night's event uh, for all of us uh, who were there. To Hong Kong University for its uh, terrific uh, facilities. And let us not forget uh, the Hong Kong students who have been so helpful uh, to all of us. So, uh, uh, and finally, to uh, all of the participants, because we know that uh, this kind of event, particularly with its uh, continuous participation, could uh, only have been as successful as you have made it. So uh, thank you uh, to all. Thank you very much to the panel for drawing together all these great ideas that were developed and raised over the last two or so days. Uh, and um, Professor Silberman, I easily can handball back now uh, your first comment. You made now my job so much easier by thanking so many of us already. Well, here we are. The last discussion is behind us. The last ideas, the last suggestions, the last views have been shared. The last session was befitting the ambitious agenda we have set for ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, after many, many months of many wonderful tasks and moments that led to this event, the one task that now follows does certainly not belong into that category. Over the past three days, we witnessed detailed, engaged, passionate, innovative, and inspiring discussions, canvassing a broad range of issues concerning the future of private international law, as well as this organization. That we could witness them marks the final step in an evolutionary process 
which commenced approximately a year ago, just about March 2017. But many, many people shaped and made this event possible. Professor Zuberman, you mentioned already many, but our distinguished moderators, our panelists, our three rapporteurs, you answered our call and your attendance, your contributions and your efforts have made this event such a great success. It is not an overstatement when I say that we have been truly honored and inspired by you and we are very grateful for that. We thank you all, indeed. It is the audience, it's the people who come to these events who make the event ultimately. Your enthusiasm for the future of the HCCH and the private international law has been infectious. Your many contributions, your comments, your questions have shaped this conference. You're a wonderful audience. I'm extremely grateful that I have been had the privilege of hosting you. Third, a great thank you to the Department of Justice of the Hong Kong uh, SAR and China. Without your support, we all would not be here either. It's wonderful to have this support, and we're looking forward to having the support into the future too. And we are very, very grateful for other generous contributions by Lipman Carras here in Hong Kong, Dawson Cornwall Solicitors in London, and of course the Hong Kong University, who provided this wonderful venue and the great hospitality that we received on campus. I boldly assert that my next thanks is also a thank you on behalf of all of us here in the room, and I take this opportunity to thank the Secretary General. Christoph, when we came up with this idea, you immediately understood and embraced the great opportunity this event could offer. You endorsed the Davos style, although, well, <laughs> the Swiss citizen, sorry. <laughs> we should have expected that. But thank you so much for your strong encouragement. It was exemplary and so much appreciated by us all that worked on it, and it was sometimes really needed. And also thank you for your continuous and unwavering support for this project throughout the journey that ends today, only to start another journey, and we're looking forward to that too. This event, of course, has been a great collaboration between an organization team, or organizing team, located both here in Hong Kong, as well as in Buenos Aires and in The Hague. The Permanent Bureau collectively pulled together and colleagues, tire, ty colleagues tirelessly organized and planned this truly exceptional global conference. And allow me just to mention a few names here. I'm sure I forget some, but Frank, Frank Poon, um, Alex Ng, Judy Xiong, Caroline Cora, um, uh, here in Hong Kong, uh, Ignacio Goico Echea, and Florencia Castro over in uh, Argentina, and my colleagues in The Hague, Livia van der Graaf, Romina Ursic, Maurice Berghout, Eugenia Gentile, and Anna Kullewein. Without these people doing one thing or another for this event, again, we all would not be here. Now, this start now getting a little bit long, and you might feel like in a bad movie where the credits are longer than the actual film. Uh, forgive me for that. Um, if I would have to put a pointer in the credits, we're probably roughly at catering now. Um, but there are friends here, obviously, in the room who I believe deserve our very special thanks. There is Edwin and Rita. I don't know exactly where you guys are, but these were the two tireless people running around, back and forth, making sure that we are here on time, that the stage was set. They coordinated in the background the electronics, the website, the payment facilities. I can't tell you what actually was required in order to get this all sorted. And you guys were behind the scene working on all of that. You have received many, many emails that were actually sent by those two guys, even though it came from the inquiry box. That's the inquiry inbox. So thank you very, very much for all your help. And Linda already foreshadowed it, but there are some friends here in the room now who made sure that we every day arrived at this venue, 
not only in one piece, but safely and without getting lost in the maze that Hong Kong University can be to those who don't know their way around here. Those who welcomed us every day with big smiles and big posters, <laughs> waving them at us and saying, please go this direction. And their cheerful, cheerful greetings echoing in the corridors. You got us on buses. You set up computers. You poured us coffee. You handed out registration, badges, bags, everything. Ladies and gentlemen, I, of course, talk about the students who are just there out at the back. They're guided and supervised by Edwin and Rita. And I say simply, you were wonderful. Thank you so, so much. But in addition, let me offer one personal hope. Many of you are just at the beginning of your careers. And if this event could not only provide a spark for the next 125 years of the Hay Conference, but also for your career in private international law, then this event has achieved so much more than we envisaged in the first place. We then inspired the youth we inspired the next generation of international lawyers. We instilled in you the passion for private international law that drives us every day. And who knows, maybe one day you will have that passion for pursuing a career in private international law, and maybe you become also part of the path of the Hague Conference of Private International Law in the next 125 years. In 1962, Tobias Asser was about 24 years old, so I suspect that's roughly the age that you have. He gave his lecture that the Secretary General was referring to in the very first opening session um, when he was appointed a professor in Amsterdam. In that speech, you could already see his passion for private international law, that passion that culminated on the 12th of September, 1893, in the first convocation of the first diplomatic session of the Hague Conference on Private International Law. And on the eve of that 125th anniversary of that occasion, we can say that the Hague Conference has developed into a preeminent global organization, striving for the progressive unification of rules of private international law and bridging the many differences and distinction between the legal systems for individuals and businesses and for the protection of children, families, and adults. The last three days instilled in me the clear belief that the future of private international law and the Hague Conference is bright. There is a vision. There is belief. There is so much willingness to progress. I have no doubt whatsoever that our conversations in this regard will continue. We will collectively set the course for private international law and the Hague Conference. We will shape that narrative for the future. And thus, with great pride, joy and satisfaction at the end of this global conference. We won't say goodbye, whether you were here for traveling for two hours, for four hours, or six hours. No, we will say, see you soon. Thank you very much. I now very briefly hand over to Dr. Bernasconi for some very last remarks. <laughs> I think you covered it all, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. But uh, no, okay, since I have the, the mic, I, I do on a slightly more official note uh, want to, of course, also extend my personal thanks uh, to, uh, first of all, the uh, government of the People's Republic of China for uh, its support and its continuing support of the work of the Hay Conference, to our friends of the DOJ here in, uh, in Hong Kong for uh, making uh, the event possible. Um, I, I do want to uh, stress that you, you have to understand, yes, that uh, one may have the idea and, and, and support a, a general project, but then uh, at the end of the day, uh, people need to implement the idea and, and make it happen. And uh, Tom, Frank, Ignacio, uh, Anselmo was also involved, and Alex, and Caroline, and who else? I, I'm, I'm forgiving, uh, forgiving uh, names, but um, you really uh, also... Uh, made this event uh, all uh, happen, and I, I think it's uh, uh, it's good if we express our appreciation again for all the actual organizers who made this happen. Thank you. And on that, I look forward to seeing you 
soon in The Hague, uh, back in Hong Kong, or anywhere else, uh, as long as we continue to hold the torch of The Hague Conference. Thank you. Thank you.